joining us today. William Freeman, our, our technical technology product manager here at APH. Uh, he's done some different things on several of our barrel products. So glad to have him uh, out here giving us this good comparison today. Let's talk about some challenges, some things that maybe have been struggles for you. So Braille displays, their uh, user interface is not traditional. It's definitely different learning a Braille display than it is learning another device. Screen re reader usage can sometimes be a barrier to learning to use Braille displays. Uh, there are quite a number of options out there. So selecting the best Braille display for a user can be difficult. Setting up and troubleshooting a Braille display sometimes can cause issues. And let's get into our learning objectives today. So we're going to learn some basic terminology for refreshable Braille displays. So uh, there's things that when you hear these words mentioned, you definitely want to know what they mean. So we're going to start with learning some of those. We're going to compare the features of the Chameleon 20 and the Mantis Q40. We'll learn how to use three onboard apps for the Chameleon and the Mantis. We'll analyze how to use four different screen readers with a Braille display. Identify how to select a Braille display for a student as well as how to, how to apply updates and troubleshoot common issues. So there's a lot to cover today. So let's turn this right over to William to get started. Thank you, Paul and Betsy Ann. Uh, hi, it's William Freeman. I'm really excited to be with you all today. And uh, let's start with some Braille display basics. So the first thing up is terminology. So these are some of the terms that you might hear when folks are talking about Braille displays. And let me just say a Braille display, you know, is a refreshable Braille display for dynamic Braille content. And we'll talk about this more, but um, it, well, let me, I'll save it for when we get there, but let's start with the terminology. So you've got the chord commands. That's a term you might hear, chord commands. And if you're like me, the first time you hear it, you're not going to know what it means. And it just means hotkeys. The term comes from the early days of computing using the word chord to mean the space bar. So one way to think of it is it started as a hotkey that uses the space bar. And a lot of the hotkeys with Braille displays will use the space bar. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is a little later. Um, host device. So there's different types of Braille displays, but the majority of them, almost basically all of them, will work with a host device. And that's the device you are connecting the Braille display to. So whether that's a phone or a tablet or a computer, the host device represents that, uh, that device. Terminal. So one thing we'll talk about is terminal mode, or you need to be in the terminal. So this is the mode that allows the Braille display to connect to a host device. You know, we'll talk about this, but there's going to be a local mode. That's when you're using the local apps. And then there's going to be a terminal mode. And that's when you're connecting to the host device. So the screen reader. And then another term you might hear, and some of you may be familiar with this, but it's used slightly differently when, you talk, when you're talking about Braille displays. So you'll hear the term computer Braille. And computer Braille is a discontinued, I know it's a shame, <laughs> Braille code that only uses single cell Braille symbols. So every symbol that you can make in computer Braille is just one cell. There's no two cell symbols. And that makes it useful for uh, Braille displays when you need something very precise like a password or a web address, things like that. It's used less and less now, uh, but there are still Braille displays that require computer Braille in some situations. And Betsy Ann has a link to, it's not accessible, but it is a keyboard uh, from uh, National Braille and from the Iowa Braille School that shows how all the computer Braille symbols correspond to a keyboard. If you need an accessible resource, you can find a uh, table through the computer Braille um, Wikipedia page. But the, I, I have a printout of the keyboard above my above my monitors and I, I use it all the time. So let's talk about how a Braille display works uh, briefly. So what I have here is a picture of a piezoelectric Braille cell. 
these are the most popular cells in use today. And thankfully, you know, through the efforts of APH and other organizations, we've got more Braille cells out there and we're getting more and more and better all the time. So this isn't the only Braille cell anymore, but it is the most popular. And I've got a picture of it here and I'll just describe it on the, the left side, kind of the start of the cell. It's actually a lot longer than you'd think it would be. It's about, uh, what, six or seven times longer than a Braille cell. So if you know how long a Braille cell is, just multiply that by about seven. But at the end, we've got the chip. So that's where the power comes in and where the, the intelligence is. And then from that, you've got four bars and each bar lever controls two dots and they're all different lengths. So the shortest bar is controlling the top dots. So dots uh, one and uh, four. And then the next one is controlling the next two and then so on until you have all eight dots. And then the other interesting thing here is each dot is um, longer than the dots ab uh, uh, above it. So dots seven and eight are very long. And then uh, uh, six and three are shorter and two and five are shorter still with uh, one and uh, three, the very top dots or one and four, the very top dots being the shortest of all. So I don't know, it's interesting. Uh, I think when folks uh, work with refreshable braille displays, you just see the pins at the top and you don't see uh, all that's going on underneath or how big these cells are. And I just think it's an interesting thing uh, to talk about. Um, one issue with this kind of cell is that you actually need to power the lever to both push the pin up and to keep it up. So battery drain can be an issue over a long period of time. Some of the new cells, they only need power to push the pin up, but once it's up, it no longer needs power. So you do get some battery savings in addition to the other changes and features. So let's talk about different kinds of braille displays. So there's note takers. If someone says this is a note taker, what they mean is it's got a full suite of local apps. So these apps are gonna include a lot of productivity apps like email and web browsing. They're gonna be pretty advanced. If someone says hybrid, this is a new term. If they say hybrid, it means a limited set of local apps. So these will be apps for file creation, reading, translation tables. So it'll be those sort of basic features. The Mantis and Chameleon are hybrid Braille displays. So we don't have a web browser, we don't have email, but we do have a suite of local apps. And then the last kind is terminal only. So a terminal only Braille display has no local functionality. It only functions in tandem with a screen reader and a host device. And of course, note taker and hybrid will also function, they have the local functionality and they work with a host device. So that brings us to our first uh, poll question. Do you all want right. to launch? And Betsy Ann, if you can launch that for us. So the question is, what is the name of the technology used in the Mantis and Chameleon Braille cells? Piezoelectric, piezoelectric, chip and pin, or chip and dip. Getting hungry here. Yeah. What's the name of the technology used in the Mantis and Chameleon Braille cells? Piezoelectric, Pisa electric, chip and pin, chip and dip. Um, feel free to answer those questions and throw your questions in the chat. We've tried to answer a couple. And there was a question about the uh, Mantis email list. I put that in there for, for someone who was interested in joining that. That's a discussion list of the mantis and i'm chameleon i think is also included it's in that same list, list yeah. yeah same list for both so if if you're interested in either you can subscribe to that list were there any other questions that folks had no questions have come in so far um 
we do have some interest in future webinars. So uh, this, uh, this webinar, the content was actually recommended to us by our listeners. So always make sure you're sharing different ideas that you'd like to see webinars on uh, because it just so happens that we can usually fulfill those uh, requests and create new webinars. Um, we do post our videos after about um, a week or two. I'm going to share the link. Uh, the webinar is recorded, so you can find that on our YouTube page in about a week. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but we want to make sure that those webinars are polished and also fully accessible. Uh, so just give us a little time. We promise it'll make it to our archives page. So we've had about 62% vote in our poll. Take another second to take a look at that poll question before we move on. And if you can't access the poll for any reason, feel free to drop your response in the chat. So with 63% having voted, what is the name of the technology used in the mantis and chameleon braille cells? 10% said chip and pin, 8% said PISA electric, and 82% said piezoelectric. Well, you, what was the correct answer? The correct answer is piezo piezoelectric. Thank you. That, uh, the piezo comes from the Greek for uh, to push or to squeeze. So I meant to say that earlier. I was I, I did not know that, so I looked it up, and then and then I forgot to share it. <laughs> well, almost did. All right. So. Let's get into a physical, we'll do a quick physical description of the mantis and the chameleon, and then we'll jump into the local functionality. And as we talk about that, we'll kind of, it'll, we're going to be focusing on the mantis and chameleon today, but I want to talk about them in a way that can be used to help generalize some information about Braille displays. All right. So we'll start with the mantis Q40, and this is a picture of the top view of the display. So it is a QWERTY keyboard with a 40 cell braille display. So that QWERTY keyboard is a laptop style keyboard with function keys. So laptop style, it doesn't have a numpad. It doesn't have those extra keys on the, on the right hand side that you normally would have, uh, but it does have all of the QWERTY keys, has arrow keys, and then has the function keys at the top. And then we've got 40 cells, braille cells, piezoelectric, uh, with router keys. So the router keys are above the braille cells, and then those are used to place your cursor. So if you're typing and you notice a typo three or four words over, rather than having to just hit left arrow, left arrow, left arrow, I mean, you, you know, I only said that three times, but imagine pressing left arrow 30 times to jump from one side of this long line to the other. And so the router keys allow you to jump the cursor to that point. So you can put, you know, press the cursor button on cell nine and the cursor will jump to cell nine. Uh, cell 18, same thing, whatever cell you need to be in. And you can also use it to activate items. So if you've got a, a multiple choice question and you've got your, your answers all on one line, you could use the router keys to activate the choice you wanna pick out of the, out of the you know, the choices, if, assuming they all fit on the same line. Um, the front edge, you can just barely see it here, but the front edge has the home button uh, as well as the four thumb keys for navigation. So the outer thumb keys are going to move by line. So they're going to go up and down. And then the inner thumb keys are going to move left and right. And we'll talk about the home button a little later. But basically, if you ever get lost, you can press the home button and that'll jump you to local mode to the top of the menu structure. So anytime you're lost, just press the home button and that'll take you to the editor, uh, which is the top of the menu of the local mode. Next is a photo of the, the left side of the Mantis. So at the top here is the USB-C. That's how you charge it. Uh, so USB-C, that's the new USB cable. Uh, and that's how you charge it. And then below that is the power button. That's how you turn it on. And then the USB-A which is gonna be that it's the older USB-A like you'd find on a thumb drive, like you're likely to find at the other end of your cell phone charger, uh, that's the USB-A. And so that is for your external storage for a thumb drive. 
And so with an external thumb drive here, you can have up to 64 gigs of external storage. That's on top of the 16 gigs of internal storage that it already has. This here is the top, the very top edge of the Mantis. And this is where you put in the SD card. So the SD card slot. And again, that's 64 gigs up to 64 gigs. So between the two, you can have 128 gigs of external storage on top of the 16 it already comes with. Next, we've got the Chameleon 20. So this is a picture of the Chameleon 20, the top view. And at the top is the, what we call a Perkins style keyboard. So a Perkins style keyboard, it's called that because it resembles the Perkins Braille writers that folks are still using and that I think folks are still gonna be familiar with. But it's gonna be in the middle, you've got the six dots, excuse me, the six buttons to make the six dots of Braille. And then flanking that on the outer edges, on the left, you've got dot seven, and on the right, you've got dot eight. Um, typically, dot seven and eight aren't gonna be used to make Braille. You know, typically they're going to be, you know, if you type in computer Braille, sure, you'll use them. Uh, but if you're not, seven is typically going to be either backspace or cancel. And then uh, dot eight is going to be typically enter to make like a new line or OK to select a value. So that's the Perkins style keyboard. Below that, we've got 20 Braille cells with router keys. And then below that still are the two space bars. Now I should say the two space bars are gonna function as a single space bar. They're just split to make it a little more uh, ergodynamic. So it is two buttons, but it's one, functions as one uh, space bar. This next picture is a close up. It's a better view of that front edge it still has the same home button and then the thumb keys. And these thumb keys, you, it's a little odd to think about and I don't want it to be confusing, but it, starting from the left side, it's gonna go up and then left and then home and then right and then down. So on the very outside, you've got up and down. On the inside, you've got left and right. And then in the center, you've got home. It sounds confusing, especially if you go up, left, home, right, down, <laughs> uh, but it's actually much simpler uh, once you are using it. On the left edge here is the same USB-C power button, USB-A. On the right side of the Mantis, or the, excuse me, the Chameleon, this is the, there's a place for a uh, audio jack. So uh, the audio plug and then the volume up and down buttons. These are not activated at the moment, but we are working to activate them at this time. And we should have something uh, really cool. We're gonna have text-to-speech for folks and on the Chameleon, and that'll be included as a, just a free upgrade. Uh, and we're hoping to have it out by September uh, for folks. So that's just a quick physical description of the Mantis and Chameleon. Let's get into the local functionality. So we're going to talk about the kind of the local apps and what's available there. So we'll start with the local menu layout. So if you're going, so one of the things that's interesting about Braille displays and that makes them somewhat challenging to people that are sighted is they have a linear interface. So we're used to spatial interfaces, like how I've typed it out here in this slide. I've got, you know, I've got a list editor terminal, library, file manager, calculator, date and time, settings, online services, user guide, and power off. So as a sighted person, that's the type of interface I'm used to. You know, I would click editor, and then that would open up a sub menu. And then I'd see the entire sub menu. And then I'd pick the item that I want from that sub menu and so on. Well, with the linear interface, since you're limited to just that one line, you're only going to see where you're at right now. So you'll just see editor. And then if you press down arrow, you'll just see terminal and so on. If you, if you are on, say, editor and then press enter, that puts you in the submenus, but you still only see one option at a time. 
And so it can be a little, it's a, it, it, you, you can almost feel like you can get lost, you know, since you can't see the whole interface. It's like, where am I? I don't know what I'm doing. And that's where the home button can come in handy because when you, when you, when you're not sure, or when you just need to quickly move, you can just press the home button and then that jumps you. It'll jump you to the editor uh, in the menu. So it'll jump you to the top of this local menu and it'll, your device will just say editor. So that's a good tip for if you get lost and you're not sure. Another uh, major tip here is first letter navigation. So if you know where you need to go, like let's say you're on editor. So your braille display says editor and you need to get to settings. Now you could press down arrow, down arrow, down arrow, down arrow, down arrow, down arrow. I think I did that the right number of times. Uh, or you could just press the letter S. So you know you need to go to settings, just press S and that'll jump you from editor to settings. If you've got two items uh, that start with the same letter, just press it twice. So say you've got two items that start with the letter uh, S, just press S once, that'll take you to the first item press S again, and that'll take you to the second item. So I think, I think both having this linear interface and kind of the, the slow, quote unquote, slow movement within the items, those I think are two of the things that throw off people that are cited the most. So I'm hoping the first letter navigation, the home button, so you can reorient yourself. And on the Mantis, you can always press escape so if you're inside a submenu, just press escape and that'll take you back up a level. On the chameleon, you can just press dot seven. So th there's always a way to jump back out a level. So enter or dot eight will take you in a level, dot seven or escape will take you out a level. Let's talk about the context menu. So another cool thing about the Mantis and the chameleon is whenever you are in a local app, and you're not sure what to do, you either don't know what's available to you or you're not sure how to do it, use the context menu. So on the Mantis, the hotkey is control plus M. M is in uh, Mantis. And on the chameleon, it is space plus M, again, as in Mantis uh, or menu. <laughs> and so if you're ever, like if you're inside the editor, just do control M and then it'll show you all the things that you can do inside the editor. It's cool because it shows you what actions are possible, shows you the hotkeys for those actions, and it allows you to do those actions. So you can open it up and you can do open file. You can, you can open it up and you can do add a bookmark, but you can also get the hotkey so that next time you need to add a bookmark or open a file, uh, you, can, you can do it without having to go to the context menu. So really, this is the only hotkey you need to know. The only hotkey you actually need to know when using the local uh, apps of the Mantis and Chameleon is this context menu key. So let's get, let's get into the apps a bit. So let's talk about using the editor. So when you're using the editor, there's a lot of different file types you can open. So you can open doc or docx. Those are both Word file types. Uh, one doc is the really old word file type. Docx is the new word file type. Txt. Txt is the most basic. That's what you get when you use Notepad on Windows. It's the most basic print file type you can make probably. And then brf and brl. You all probably are familiar with brf and brl, but those are both Braille file types. Brfs are formatted. Brls are not. Both this is, this is a little advanced, but both are basically text files. So TXT, a BRF and a BRL are, um, when you break it down, what makes them up, they are text files. They're just made more for Braille. So that's just a little, a little factoid about them. And then now uh, we also open PDFs. So we've got basic PDF support. You wanna stick to text-based PDFs. And I will tell you, if you try to open a PDF that is mostly images, it probably won't open. Uh, you know, PDFs are, are, everybody knows this, PDFs are complicated. 
and support for them is tough. So I'm happy uh, we're able to open the text-based PDFs and go ahead and try it if you're not sure. And, um, you know, we'll go from there. Uh, when you edit a file, everything gets saved as a text file. So if you open a docx and you start editing it, what you get is a text file. And that's because doc and docx and PDF all have a lot of formatting that we can't support uh, at this time. Uh, and it, it's gonna be in print as well. Uh, we cannot open RTF and on the, the, there is a file size limit. So the file size limit, if it's a print file, it's two megabytes. If it's a Braille file, it's actually 221,000 characters. And the reason for that character limit is because we have to back translate the uh, Braille file. Um, now we have plans in an update, we're gonna be adding a BRF editor. When we add that BRF editor, you'll be able to open, because we're not gonna translate it. Since we don't have to translate it, you'll only be subject to the two megabyte limit which a two megabyte BRF is a very large uh, BRF. Now, Braille file, uh, the other question here is RTF files. And you can open RTF to uh, view, but at the moment you cannot open them to edit. It's something we can look at uh, adding in the future, but for right now, RTF is read only. All right, so when you're in the editor, you've got some options. And this is all on the context menu. So there's the file menu and the edit menu. From the file menu, it's got all the things you'd expect, open, save, save as. And then it also has a read mode. What's read mode? Read mode is a mode you can enter that lets you read the file without worrying about accidentally editing it. So it keeps you in the editor, but lets you lock editing. So you can go ahead and read and know you're not gonna mess anything up. It also has an editor setting to confirm deletion. So this way you don't accidentally delete something that you wanted to keep. Uh, I keep it on, I would suggest you keep it on, but if you're the type of person that likes to live on the edge, you know, go ahead and turn it off. And your other options here are the edit menu. We've got a, a basic find and replace, or excuse me, a basic find. So you can use that to search your file and that'll be a print based, since you're in the editor, it'll be a print based uh, find. Let's talk about using the library. So the library can open a lot of files, a lot more files than the editor. And that's because all we have to do is open it. We don't have to worry about editing. So docx, txt, brf, brl, pef. Now pef is a, a file type Americans may not be familiar with, but that is in portable, portable embosser format. And it is mainly used for graphics and embossing. And it's used a lot in uh, Europe. HTML, DAISY, MISO, RTF, and PDF. Uh, we do not have EPUB support at this time, but it's something you know we'll be able to look at in the future. There's no promises there, but it's something we can definitely look at. Now, the file size limitations, since we don't have to back translate, the file size, uh, the file types uh, limitation is 100 megabytes. Um, now, one thing about that is just as an example, War and Peace, I looked, at, I looked this up, and well, my own files I have, uh, War and Peace as a text file is about 3.2 megabytes. So that's a, a famously large book. So you can fit a lot of War and Pieces inside a 100 megabyte file. So it's a pretty, I think it's a good, even though it sounds like a terrible limitation, it's a pretty good uh, file size limit when you think of how, ma how many words that is. Now in the library, there is a lot of different uh, functionality you've got. So you've got quick navigation. And then here the options are gonna vary based on the file type. So a file type with more formatting, you're gonna be able to take advantage of that formatting and navigate using it. So if the file has headings, you know, you'll be able to navigate by those headings. But you, know, you can definitely, there's, there's basic options like lines, sentences, paragraphs, that sort of thing that you can use for your quick navigation. There's also bookmarks. Uh, there's several ways you can enter and work with bookmarks. Uh, what I've got here is just a quick bookmark. So you can go ahead and just on the Mantis, you can just press control 
plus B to put in a quick bookmark. On the chameleon, you can do enter plus B to make a quick bookmark. And either way, it'll give you a way to come back to that point in the book. And this is again, and I totally understand this sentiment of getting lost in a book, of feeling like it's not quite accurate, but I, I, I sometimes get when I'm using a braille display, it's, this sounds so dramatic, but it, it's almost feels like you're going to drown or something like you're so deep into the book and you're never going to be able to find this spot again uh, because it's this, you know, linear interface. Uh, and I think bookmarks and quick navigation is how you combat that feeling. The other way you can combat that feeling is with the where am I command. So the where am I command will tell you what page you're on, what line you're on, where you are in the book. And that too will vary a little bit depending on how much formatting is there is in the file type you're reading. But it's a good way to fight that feeling of like, where am I and what am I doing? Uh, Mantis, it's control plus W. Chameleon, it is space plus the WH contraction. For those that don't know Braille or don't know, uh, or maybe use a different Braille code, uh, the WH contraction is dots 156. 156. Um, another cool thing um, is auto scroll. So with auto scroll, you've got um, it'll move by one line at a time. And this is going to move by. Um, the same as the, inter th the inner thumb keys. So the inner thumb keys are moving left and right. So let's say you've got a 20 cell line, or no, excuse me, let's say you've got a 40 cell line and a 20 cell Braille display. When you press that right thumb key, it'll move you from the first 20 cells to the second 20 cells. Uh, and that's what auto scroll is gonna do. I love auto scroll and I love the inner thumb keys because you know you're not gonna miss anything. The outer thumb keys, you could potentially miss something because you'll be skipping line by line by line. It's a good way to move quickly through a book, but you might miss information. And auto scroll, you can set the time. Uh, you can speed it up or slow it down, but that'll cause the the pay the line to scroll uh, by you know by a set amount of time, so that you can read without having to stop and press the uh, the advanced you know the advanced keys the thumb keys. On the Mantis, it is Alt plus G. And on the Chameleon, it is Space plus Q. And uh, so that's how you auto scroll. And we've got some improvements coming to auto scroll in the future. Like we're going to remember your speed and start with the same speed every time instead of having to do it manually each time. And uh, I think that's a good, it's a good way to read. Uh, I don't know that it's for me. I maybe have a little more anxiety than that. And I would feel the pressure knowing that it was going to scroll whether I was to the end of the line or not. So the next thing is Wi-Fi. So both the chameleon and the mantis have Wi-Fi. And we'll talk about why you would want to use Wi-Fi. Uh, but let's first talk about how you connect. So the first thing you're going to do is and remember that that file structure I showed you you're gonna to go to settings. And you can get there, just press S and it'll jump to settings. And once you're in there, you'll be in the sub menu and you'll go to Wi-Fi. And you can get there by pressing W. Now once, so go ahead and once you're there, press enter to go into Wi-Fi. And the first thing will be Wi-Fi and you'll wanna turn it on. It'll be off by default to preserve battery, but go ahead and turn it on. Then you'll select new connection then you'll select scan for SSID. So the SSID is your Wi-Fi. So, you know, I like, I like to pretend that I'm funny. So my Wi-Fi name is actually hidden network. So I would find hidden network and select it. Once you select it, you'll have a field where you type in your password. Now, this used to be more complicated. You used to have to use computer braille in this field. And that is confusing for folks, but no more. Now it will use whatever code you are currently using. So if you're currently using contracted UEB, then you type your password in using contracted UEB. So once you enter it, it'll, it'll send your password and you should be able to connect just like that. And you'll stay connected 
as long as you want to stay connected and are near your Wi-Fi router. So this is the process to get you started. And once you're done, you should be good to go. Now, why would you want to hook up Wi-Fi? My favorite thing for Wi-Fi are the online libraries. So these are US only, and you've got to have an account. I think you might be able to have a Bookshare account internationally. I, I, I say US only, I don't actually know. You, it'll be between you and Bookshare, but you need a Bookshare account or an NFB Newsline account. So you'd need an account and these do cost, you don't have to pay for them. Uh, but once you have the account, you can sign in and on Bookshare, you can search for books, you can check out books, and then you can download them to read in your uh, library. And it is a great resource. It, it basically takes the Braille display and makes it more like something like a Kindle Paperwhite or something like that. And I, it, there's so many books available on uh, uh, Bookshare. The, the Wi-Fi is limited to 2.4 gigahertz. Um, it's gonna be fine, I think, for when you're at home. There can be issues when you're in schools because schools um, will want the, uh, will tend to use the more secure five gigahertz Wi-Fi. Oh, and I, I'm hearing, thank you, Sarah. Uh, NFB Newsline is free and Bookshare. Yes, Bookshare is free for students. Thank you for, yeah, I knew that, but I didn't say it. So thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, and NFB Newsline, you can manage your subscriptions. So you can subscribe to different magazines and periodicals. And then the app will automatically check for new issues and delete old issues as needed. These are both a really great way to read more Braille. That's kind of my thing is just getting folks reading Braille and using Braille as much as possible. And so anything that will help with that is, is great for me. Uh, does not have NLS barred. Um, I don't think we have plans to support it at this time, especially since the NLS display is coming out and that's going to be free for folks and it's going to have NLS barred support, I think. That's my understanding. So the other reason you want to have um, Wi-Fi is you can update using Wi-Fi. So if you're connected to Wi-Fi, you can update by going to settings and then going to software update. And then what that'll do is it'll check and see if there is an update available. If there's an update available, it'll ask you, do you want to download it? And then it will follow your instructions from there. Um, if you either don't have Wi-Fi or you don't have reliable Wi-Fi, or if you're updating a lot of units, if you're updating a lot of units, it's much quicker to update via an external drive. So if you're updating you know, for a bunch of students all at once, download the update file from APH, just go to the shop page for the Mantis or Chameleon, go to the download section, it'll be right there. It'll become as a zipped folder. You want to unzip it. It's The file is an SWU file. So that's just, it's the, the file type that it is. So unzip it and then take that SWU file and put it on your thumb drive. You wanna put it at what is called the root of the thumb drive or SD card. All root means is that it cannot be inside any folder. So basically, as soon as you open up that thumb drive, you want to see that SWU file. And then you want to plug the thumb drive into the display while it is turned on. Uh, it can be helpful to make the SWU file the only file on the drive, um, especially, if, uh, especially if you're updating a lot of units because that will make it quicker for the Braille display to find the update file and start applying it. The one other thing here is the unit must be charging, so connected to the charger, and have a battery charged at 50% or more. So you wanna be plugged into the charger and have a battery charged at 50% or more. This is to make sure there's no issues where you know the battery gives out while you're in the middle of an update. That could be really bad for your unit. And you'd, you'd have to, if something did happen there, you'd have to return it. So by having both fail safes in place, you should be covered and never have to worry about that happening. All right, time for our next uh, poll question. Okay. All right, Bessie Ann, you can launch that when you're ready. Got it. All right, so this is a true or false question. Uh, true or false, the Mantis and Chameleon can open and edit PDF files. 
Mantis and Chameleon can open and edit PDFs. True or false? Great. And some. one question did come in, William, that you weren't able to address in the moment. Are there opportunities for users of both products to beta test the firmware releases? Yes. Um, we have a beta test team. Um, trying to think of the best way. Go ahead and join uh, our main mailing list. Great. And then from there, you're welcome to request. I'm trying to keep the beta team small. So it's easier to manage, but you, your questions already suggest that you're the type of person we want on the beta test team. So uh, we do have opportunities for folks to. And if it's saying computer code required, you may need to update your chameleon because it did used to be chameleon. It did used to be computer code required, but now it's it shouldn't it shouldn't shouldn't still require computer code. So you may need to update your uh, chameleon there. Yeah, if you just received it, it's definitely not been updated yet. Uh, we we put out updates pretty frequently, and I know from the time we get the unit to the time the unit gets sold to the time the unit gets shipped. I mean, updates have come out. Uh, several updates have come out probably since that. So I would I would go ahead and update it manually, and that'll make the whole process easier for you. I think. Great. I think you were able to get to all of the other questions that came in. Um, we are officially halfway through the webinar. We're, we've got 45 minutes left, just a time update. Um, and there's a question about a command list for JAWS and Windows apps. Yes. So that's something we have a list and we're actually testing. We're testing the list now. Uh, it's something I'm, I need to get get done and we're going to test the list and put branding on it and all that good stuff and we'll have a command list for jaws and ios available for folks so that is something we have in the works we just want to right. make sure it's all correct before we post it absolutely well let's take a look at this poll about 57 percent have voted so again take a look at this poll question as we're wrapping up true or false the mantis and chameleon can open and edit pdfs 47 percent said true 54 percent said false william what was the correct answer the correct answer is true great Awesome. I'm going to end that poll and we can move forward. All right. So let's talk about terminal mode. So terminal mode is going to be a bit more complicated and we'll get into why. But again, terminal mode is when you're connecting to a screen reader. Um, so you're connecting to a screen reader, you're connecting to a host device. So supported screen readers are for Windows, it's going to be JAWS and NVDA. We have some narrator support. Um, narrator's getting there. It's getting better all the time. Uh, I'm rooting for it. I, I want narrator to be good. Um, but right now, you're mainly you're going to want to stick with JAWS and NVDA. Um, on a MacBook, uh, you're going to use VoiceOver. On iOS devices, you're going to use VoiceOver. And then on, we now have Chromebooks. You can use ChromeVox, which is their screen reader, via USB. So USB only. You can use ChromeVox on a Chromebook. So those are kind of our, those are the breakdown of our supported screen readers. Uh, the big one you'll notice that's not on here is uh, Brailleback with Android. And that's something, you know, we've done everything we can there to get that ready. Uh, and it's just a matter of getting it implemented. Uh, on the Brailleback side. So if you want to see uh, Chameleon and Mantis uh, support on Android, uh, you know, and you've got a way to bother <laughs> the folks that uh, do the development for Android or uh, Brailleback, uh, reach out to those folks and let them know that's something you want to see on Android going forward. All right, so screen reader fundamentals. So the, the big thing here is the host device oversees basically all functionality. So that's the Braille code. That's the hotkeys. That's the options. 
since the host device oversees all this functionality, you're going to get different behavior from the same display when using a different screen reader. So if you go from NVDA to JAWS, say, so you're still using Windows, you're going to have different hotkeys, you're going to have different support for Braille tables, you're going to have different options available to you. Uh, going from one screen reader to another, it really is about as dramatic as going from one operating system to another. So going from your phone to Windows, uh, for example. And, you know, if a person knows one screen reader, they're going to be more likely to have an easier time learning another screen reader. Uh, but there's going to be a learning process. You know, you can't just go from JAWS and then sit down and start using voiceover and suddenly you know how to do everything. It, actually, going from JAWS to voiceover will be rough. Going from JAWS to NVDA, that'll be fairly easy. You know, like, okay, these all make sense. I'm still using the Windows keys. I get it. Uh, but going into voiceover from JAWS can be, there's quite a, a jump there. And narrator is supported, but I wouldn't recommend it just yet. Like, it's got the most basic fundamental support. Uh, you're you're going to be better off if you want a free screen reader that supports uh, these displays. You're, you'll be better off with NVDA than with narrator. Now, the other thing about screen readers is they have a modifier key when using a keyboard. So the, the thing with the modifier key is you basically need a chord. Remember we talked about chord commands? You need a key that isn't being used otherwise. Because think about all the hotkeys that can exist, like inside Word. Word has dozens and dozens of hotkeys and the screen reader can't interfere with any of those hotkeys. But then it also can't interfere with any of the hotkeys inside your browser or just when you're on your desktop. Uh, so this modifier key is gonna be a key that's like outside of normal uh, keyboard usage. So with JAWS, for example, the modifier key by default is gonna be insert. And then you can optionally change it to caps lock. And so the idea here is you can press insert and then up arrow uh, or insert down arrow or insert A. And these are all hotkeys. And you know they've got too many hotkeys for me to name all of them or to go through all of them. Uh, and you can find resources for these online fairly easily. But by, by having these modifier keys, you can have as many hotkeys as you'd expect um, without worrying about interfering with normal functionality of you know, the, the normal hotkeys outside of the screen reader when using Windows, when using iOS, whatever it is. So we'll cover it when we talk about the individual, uh, when we talk about the individual um, screen readers. But each one has its own modifier keys and those can be changed. And it's kind of a special thing that if you just sat down at a computer to use JAWS or NVDA or any of them, you wouldn't necessarily find it on your own without knowing it was already there. The other thing you're gonna find, so we've got the Mantis with the QWERTY keyboard, and then we've got the Chameleon with the Perkins keyboard. So the Mantis, that's, that's supported. Basically, no matter what you use, it's supported because you know everybody has a keyboard. Everybody knows what a keyboard is. It's fine. The Perkins Braille keys, that's where you run into trouble. And we'll talk about it some. And it's going to vary from, from uh, uh, screen reader to screen reader, whether it has hotkeys at all. Some of them don't have hotkeys at all for a Perkins Braille keyboard. So, or some will have very basic uh, hotkeys that you can use. And so what happens when you're using a Perkins, if the screen reader doesn't support uh, Perkins, then you're going to have to take your hands off the Braille display and use the keyboard and then, you know, use the keyboard, do what you need to do, and then go back to the Perkins and do what you need to do there. And that can be annoying, you know, having to find the, the you know, where did I put the Braille display? Is it on the left side, the right side? You know, where is it? You know, that can be an issue. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, with Mantis, you know, basically anywhere you have an option on the modifier key, you'll want to set it for caps lock uh, rather than insert. 
just because we don't have an insert key. So how to connect via Bluetooth. So connecting via Bluetooth can be, it can be annoying. It can be annoying. Luckily, you only have to do it uh, rarely. But you'll start, remember, we, had, we went through that whole menu. So you've got editor, and then you've got terminal. So you want to go to terminal. And then within terminal, you go to add Bluetooth device. So when you go to add Bluetooth device, that's going to make your display discoverable to host devices. So, but what we mean by discoverable is they'll be able to find it. Um, without being discoverable, it'll never be found. Like you'll never be able to go into the Bluetooth on your host device and find the Mantis and say, go connect to that. It won't be there. It won't be there until you make it discoverable by using this option to add a Bluetooth device. Um, so once you've made it discoverable, you go to your host device under Bluetooth and find where it'll say Mantis or Chameleon, and it'll have the serial number of your device. So if you're in a classroom, pay special attention to your serial number to make sure you don't accidentally pair to your friend's Braille display. Though I'm sure kids have a lot of fun uh, pairing to each other's Braille displays and messing with each other. I'm, I'm sure that's a good time that kids have. Um, once you, so once you pair it, so you make it discoverable, then you pair it on the host. Now it will be, you'll find it inside the terminal menu. You go back to the terminal menu and go to selected device, uh, excuse me, connected devices. And when you find connected devices, you'll find your host device. A key thing here is you want to give your host devices, and this will vary, but you want to give your host device a name that you can use to identify it. Like I have two iPads. Like I have a personal iPad that I use for work sometimes. And then I have a work iPad that I use for work. And so I named my work iPad, the APH iPad. And then my personal is William's iPad. And this will make it easy to find which device is which. Uh, you wouldn't want to just call everything, you know, in my case, I wouldn't want everything to be called Williams because then, you know, Williams PC, Williams iPad, because it'll make it harder to find everything in the list. So giving, giving your devices a, a unique name will make switching between them easier. Um, so go into connected devices, everything you've set up will be there. Um, another thing here is for you, USB is simpler to do. You don't have to make it discoverable. You don't have to do anything on the host device really to get it going. Uh, you just go terminal, connected devices, and then the top thing there is going to be USB connection. And then you've got a cable, the USB cable, which can vary depending on your host device uh, that connects the two things. Uh, you're not going to use that on a phone or a tablet, but you could use it on a Chromebook, uh, Mac OS, or Windows computer. So it is easier but then you've got, a, you've got the, the cable uh, limiting you and um, keeping you connected. The good thing about it is it will also keep your Braille display charged. So you'll charge and be connected at the same time. So it's a personal choice. Um, the Mantis and Chameleon both support being connected to up to five devices. And the way you, you switch between them is you, you, you'll, so you'll be connected to them. You'll be in the terminal. Now, the thing about the terminal is everything you're doing inside the terminal is dictated by the host device. You know, that's what we've said. So you'll need to hit the home button to go back to local. So press the home button, that'll take you back to local. And then from there, go through connected devices and then pick the, another host device to utilize. So you're connected to your iPhone, you press the home button, and then you go through and you pick your PC, and now you're connected to that and vice versa to go back and forth between them. Uh, we're looking at a hotkey that you'll be able to use to automatically switch between host devices without having to go back to local. One of these things though with uh, making a hotkey is you have to be very careful. When you make a hotkey for terminal mode, uh, you want to make sure you don't accidentally assign a hotkey that would otherwise be used by the screen reader or operating system. So. We're, it's something we're looking at for a future update, but you've got to be very careful to make sure you, you get it right. 
All right. So let's talk about the basics of each of these screen readers. So we're going to go through JAWS, VoiceOver, uh, NVDA, and ChromeVox. So JAWS. JAWS has solid support for keyboards and Perkins style keys. So if you're using JAWS, you've got hot keys for your keyboard and your Perkins. One of the things here is JAWS does tend to do their Braille display support on a per display basis. So just because you've used JAWS with a Perkins style Braille display before, doesn't mean everything's gonna be exactly the same on another Perkins style Braille display. Things will be very, very similar, but there can be differences from one display to the next. The default modifier key, we've already said, is insert, but caps lock is available. You just put your JAWS in laptop mode, and that'll be on the splash screen. Like when you first turn on JAWS, uh, or no, excuse me, that's NVDA. I'm getting myself confused. Uh, but you'll be able to set caps lock as your modifier key in JAWS. Um, one of the great things about JAWS for a user is JAWS uh, being a paid uh, screen reader, it has many methods where it attempts to make things that are inaccessible, accessible, uh, including OCR and other means of navigation, uh, other little tricks that they do to get around inaccessible content. Um, it's something you're not really gonna find with the other screen readers. And we'll talk about how those other screen readers work and how they approach things. Like they'll have similar features, but uh, I think it'll be clear as we talk about them what I mean here. Uh, it has support for math content, including Nimeth. So if you're connected via Braille display and you come across, uh, it's called MathML, which is a type of math content that's used online that will display as Nimeth in your, uh, on your Braille display. Now, the one issue with JAWS is, you, you, like we've said, is that you do have to purchase it. So there's an annual license. You can, if you're a student, you can get that through APH. And then there's also, you can pay a one-time fee for a perpetual license and then just pay for, I think, I don't know how many updates you get. You get so many updates with your perpetual license and then you have to pay uh, a smaller fee after that point to, to continue to get updates. So those are kind of the basics of JAWS. Uh, thank you, uh, Margarita saying three updates, which is what I was thinking, but uh, I wasn't positive. All right. So the next thing is voiceover. Um, voiceover has solid support for both keyboard and Perkins style keys. Uh, the default modifier keys are control plus option. Uh, you can also set it for caps lock. I would, uh, I would suggest doing that. On the Mantis, we simulate the Mac keyboard. Uh, one of the cool things, so it's a Windows keyboard. It's got a Windows key on it. It's a QWERTY keyboard, but we simulate all sorts of different kinds of keyboards. So like we have international options. So we can simulate, uh, like in France, they, instead of QWERTY, they have Azerty keyboards. We can simulate an Azerty keyboard. Um, and then we simulate the Mac keyboard. So on a, a Mantis, your modifier keys when using voiceover will be control and windows. So the windows key and the control key. What I would recommend is setting your modifier key for caps lock. So you're only having to press the one key. One of the really annoying things on iOS is to activate things. It's control plus option plus space. So to make that a little easier on yourself, you can go caps lock space. And you set that by going in through settings, accessibility, then voiceover, then typing, then modifier keys, and then set it there to use caps lock. Uh, that's what I would recommend. Now, the cool thing about voiceover is it's a lockdown system. This is the advantage that uh, Apple has over... Um, um, JAWS, NVDA, and the other, and Chromevox. So Android is an open system. Anybody can make an Android app, anybody. It's almost, it's basically the Wild West. <laughs> uh, Windows is the same thing. Anybody can make an app for Windows. It's again, the Wild West. Uh, VoiceOver with Mac, they've got more of a lockdown system. They have rules. There's things you've got to do to follow. Uh, if you don't get in their store, 
they warn you not to install the app. They're very strict. And as a developer, it can be annoying, but as a user, it's great because that's why they have such good accessibility. That's why most people that are blind, the phone that they have is most likely an iPhone, at least in the United States. Uh, and it's because the accessibility is so good. And the accessibility is so good, it's not just the lockdown system, it's because Apple has put all this good work into making their, their screen reader so good, but it's definitely helped by how locked down their system um, is. Uh, so we've got some questions. Is UEB math supported? On voiceover, it is. I could not find any evidence that it's supported on JAWS. If anybody knows of UEB math being supported on JAWS, let me know. Everything I found said Nimeth code only. And then we've also got some folks on the Mantis list want to be able to use Braille keyboard mode with the Mantis when connected to iOS. Is this gonna be possible later on? It's something we're looking at and uh, we've got a, a robust roadmap planned. So that's something we're looking at uh, and making the function keys uh, do some more cool stuff for folks, like what folks are expect with a normal Bluetooth keyboard. So on voiceover, you can use Nimeth and UEB math. Um, it has a great quick start tutorial the first time you turn it on. You can also activate it later. And then the other cool thing is it's free. So it's free, it's on iOS and Mac OS. It's, it, the other cool thing here is the, the skill set transfers. So if you can use it on iOS, you can use it on Mac OS. Uh, Mac OS, uh, it even takes your uh, mouse pad, your uh, uh, little trackpad, and you can use touchscreen controls on that little uh, touchpad, which is a neat little, a neat little touch. It's annoying though, if you're a sighted tester like me and you wanna cheat and use your mouse, you, you have to disable that if you wanna cheat. So Chromevox. So Chromevox has solid support for keyboards, makes it work great with the Mantis, but not for Perkins style keys. Their, their Perkins style keyboard support is not great. If you've got a kid using a Perkins style keyboard, they're gonna probably end up needing to use their QWERTY keyboard and then turn over to their Braille. Uh, you know, we're doing everything we can work with Google to make that Perkins style key support better. And I know they're working on it, but right now I'd really recommend on Chromevox, if you have a choice, if you can choose Mantis or Chameleon, uh, choose a Mantis because then you can have your QWERTY keyboard, you've got all your support right there and it's built in and it's ready to go and you've got your Braille right there with you. Now, the one thing here too is support for the Mantis and Chameleon is via USB only. So it's USB only and uh, we're working to get Bluetooth uh, support. Now, the modifier key is the search key. So the search key on uh, Chromebooks is typically where on a normal keyboard, you'd find the caps lock key. On the Mantis, we use the Windows key. So where the Windows key is located, that's going to be your modifier key. It also has, which I, below I call the Chrome key. And so you, it also has a learn mode that allows you to explore the different hotkeys and explore your physical keyboard. And to activate that, you, you have a Chrome box turned on and then press the Chrome key, which if you're using a Mantis is the Windows key. And then press that and then press O and then press K. So the way I typed it is a little misleading. It's not all three at once. It's Chrome, it's Windows key and then O, and then Windows key, continue holding the Windows key and press K. And so that's a good way to learn it. And then it is free uh, on Chromebooks. And so many people in schools right now are using Chromebooks. So it's great. I think that we're able to get the Braille support with the Mantis and the Chameleon on Chromebooks and I'm glad it's free and um, I look forward to it getting better and better over time. Last but certainly not least is NVDA. So NVDA has solid support for keyboards. Um, you're gonna have hotkeys, you're gonna have everything you need there. It also has Perkins style key support and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is it's available only really via an add-on called Braille Extender. And I've heard different things and, you know, I, I've used it some, um, 
I haven't used it as much as I'd like to, but it's not as intuitive as some of the other screen readers built in options. So it has Perkins style key support and it's getting better, but I wouldn't say it's as good as what you'll get with JAWS or voiceover. And it's a solid choice. NVDA is so good and it's getting better all the time. The latest, uh, I'm looking forward, there's a WebAIM survey coming out soon. It might've come out since I last checked, but the 2019 WebAIM had NVDA for the first time neck and neck with JAWS as the primary screen reader that folks are using, which I think is really cool. I think more options is always better. So um, it's a, and another thing, this will be interesting for folks, uh, NVDA is great for testing. So if you develop things or if you're making a, something that you want to share with people that use screen readers, NVDA is a great way to test whether the thing you're making is accessible because it follows the rules. JAWS has paid customers. So JAWS cheats a little bit and makes things that aren't accessible, accessible. Uh, NVDA doesn't really do that. If something's not accessible, it will also not be accessible with NVDA. So I love NVDA and I love it especially for testing because it, it lets me know uh, there's a mistake here, there's an issue there. And then I can tell the developer or whoever how to fix the, the, the problem. And the other great thing about NVDA, uh, thank you, William, uh, is free for Windows. So yes, go NVDA. Now, the next thing here is troubleshooting. So older screen readers will not work with the Mantis and Chameleon. And the reason is because they're using a new protocol. We're using a new protocol because it lets us do some cool stuff. Like one of the cool things we can do is you can, you can wake up your device using our display. With the old protocol, the Braille display got treated like a uh, monitor. And so you can't wake up a device with a monitor. Well, with our new protocol, um, you can use, um, you can wake up the device with the Mantis or Chameleon. And we've got a question, what's the best display uh, to use if the student has a Chromebook? I would recommend the Mantis because it has a keyboard and Chromevox has good keyboard support, but not good uh, Perkins key support. So Mantis is the short answer. So the, the screen readers that you'll need are iOS 13.6 or later, but know that 14 is much better. So everything 14 or later is much better than 13.6. Mac OS X 15.5.1 or later, and then JAWS 2020 or later. So indefinitely, you know, with some, especially with something new, uh, the newer updates are gonna be better. iOS, um, we're, we're using their new head protocol. And so they've, they've done some things and we're working with them and it's, it's each update's better than the update before it. And the, the support's really solid right now. If you have any issues, reconnecting devices can help clear out those issues. So for reconnecting, you'll wanna forget the pairing on both the host device and the display and then repair. Um, before you reconnect, go ahead and turn Bluetooth off and on. Uh, so just turn it off and turn it back on on the host device and then turn it off and turn it back on on the Braille display. And then that should help clear out any connection issues that you might have. Connection issues are rare, but when they happen, they're annoying. So that's why I wanted to make sure I co uh, covered them. Now, one of the things, one of the places where they will um, come up is when you get a major update. So when iOS goes from 15 to 16, that's a major update. So just going from 14.2 to 14.3 isn't necessarily a problem. But when you go from say 14 to 15, you probably want to want to, if you have some issues, go ahead and just reconnect those devices to clear out any issues. They likely change something about how Bluetooth works. And then we're just, we'll just need you to reconnect to take advantage of those changes. So that's a little bit of troubleshooting there on Bluetooth issues. So now we will go to our last poll question. All right. And uh, so our question here is, what determines the grade of Braille on a refreshable Braille terminal? So when you're reading, what's gonna determine what type of Braille you're reading? Is it the display, 
the computer slash smart device, the screen reader, or the keyboard? What's going to determine the greater Braille that's on your refreshable Braille terminal? The display, the computer slash smart device, the screen reader itself, or the keyboard? All right, and I think, William, you've been doing really great answering all of the questions as they come in, so I'm not sure uh, if we've missed anything. If we did miss your question, please go ahead and put that back in the chat. And if there's any other resource, if you need the link again, or if you need something else I can provide you, please let us know. You can place those requests in the chat. Ooh, Linda's asking about future designs. Yeah. Um... I mean, there's a lot going on here and I can't talk about everything that APH is doing. We've got a lot of stuff that we're doing, but uh, we have publicly talked about where you know, we're in the beginning phases of working on a dynamic tactile display. And so that'll be a multi-line Braille display, the holy grail of Braille. And we're gonna be at NFB uh, talking about that. So join us. Um, is that, it's not next week, is it next week? Uh, it's the week of July the 5th. It starts on the yeah. 6th and it ends the 10th. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's ne next week. Join us next week to hear even more about the DTD. Um, but, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff that we're doing, and we've got a, a lot of stuff coming to the Mantis and Chameleon. So we've got um, quite a roadmap ahead of us, including BRF editor, text-to-speech. Uh, we're going to be adding Spanish to the Chameleon in an upcoming update. So we've got a lot going on. Can students enter information in the search bar in order to search the internet uh, with the Chameleon and JAWS? So yes, JAWS has great Perkins keyboard support. So you can type, you can have the what you type appear, you know, you can put in basically using the, you know, uncontracted or contracted and get print text. So yeah, you, you should have no trouble using the search bar uh, with the Chameleon and JAWS. And then, yeah, NFB is next week, Tuesday through Saturday. And then uh, does VoiceOver support Perkins-style keyboards? Uh, yes, it does. So the Perkins-style keyboard support, the best is going to be JAWS and VoiceOver. Uh, NVDA has some, but it's you've got to use this plugin, and it it's not as intuitive as folks would like. And then ChromeVox has the early stages, but I would not recommend it at this point. It doesn't mean you can't use a Perkins style keyboard. So you could have a chameleon and a Chromebook and you're fine. You'll just be, you'll, you'll end up having to rely on the keyboard. So you'll be switching your hands, keyboard back to the chameleon, chameleon back to the keyboard. So. All right, well, we've had 55% complete this poll. Uh, there are a few more questions that came in. Do we want to answer those or wait until the end of the presentation as we're uh, about 11 minutes away from our stop time? We've got a question about who we'd recommend each display for, and we're going to be covering that. So I'll cover that in just a moment. All right. Then, uh, will there be a dictionary option in a later update? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's something we hadn't, you know, we hadn't thought about. Um, so Right now, I'm thinking I've imagined folks would just have a dictionary in their library and then use find to sort through that. But that's something to think about. That'd be something pretty cool. So something we might, we, you know, we might consider. Great. Well, let's go ahead and reveal the results of the poll. This one is a real mixed bag. Um, of where folks were landing. And I think so that's hopefully... my fault. I think that's my <laughs> fault. I don't think I covered this as clearly okay. as I should have. Well, but... then it's good we did a poll question so we have a moment to clarify. So for the question, what determines the grade of Braille on a refreshable Braille display? 41% said the screen reader, 28% says the computer and or the smart device, 25% says the Braille display, and 6% say the keyboard. So William, what's the correct response? So yeah, the grade of Braille on a refreshable Braille terminal is determined by the screen reader. So yeah, the screen reader's in charge. The screen reader is running the whole show. When you connect to a terminal, uh, to that host device, the screen reader is basically all your options, everything you're doing is set by that screen reader, not by us or by Windows. All right, let's go to our discoveries. 
All right. So as we've talked about today, there are quite a number of factors you want to take into consideration when you're selecting an appropriate Braille device. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. Uh, if you know Braille, you can learn to use a Braille display. Uh, you don't have to be a screen reader expert to get started. I'm sure, that knowledge can help. But to get started, you really don't have to be an expert. And there's a lot of resources available out there to help you select a Braille display or learn about mu using any one of these devices. So, William, can you talk to, to us a little bit more about which display is right for you? Yeah, thank you. How Paul. you determine that. And also, another thing, too, uh, you're talking about future developments, something we're working on right now. Uh, the working name, I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain. The working name is Visual Display App, but we're working and it will be accessible. So don't let the word visual throw you off, but we're working on an app that will allow uh, people that can't read Braille to connect to a mantis or a chameleon and get the text of the mantis or chameleon shown to them in print. So that'll be a real benefit, I think, to teachers that work with students who use Braille displays but can't read Braille themselves. So that's something we're working on. And that'll be free uh, once it's available. But which display is right for you? So we've got the Mantis Q40 and the Chameleon 20. The Mantis Q40 is going to be better for older students, students learning keyboard navigation or learning to type, and also professionals and power users. Uh, the Mantis has been extremely, extremely popular uh, with adult consumers. And so it's a really great device for transitioning into the workplace uh, for, you know, middle school, high school, into college, into the workforce, the Mantis Q40. And it, another great thing about it is um, one of the problems I hear about is st students don't want to take their Braille display out. They, they have it, but they don't want to use it. Well, with the Mantis, it's a keyboard. It's got all this functionality. You can control your phone. You can do all this stuff. They're more likely to leave it out and use it. Uh, I find than a Perkins keyboard. Uh, and then the Chameleon 20 is great for students learning Braille, people on the go that need a smaller display, and people that prefer a Perkins style keyboard. I'm a Braille transcriber and I know plenty of Braille transcribers that can type way, way, way faster on a Perkins than anybody else could type on a, uh, 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 a QWERTY because you don't have to travel, you can just go up and down. So there can be advantages to that. And I'll get to these questions after, after this next bit. So Paul, do you want to run through? Sure. So let's just briefly run through these. Uh, we've got photos up here as well for each one of them. I mean, we've given you the basic information, but just so you're aware, the Mantis Q40 obviously has those, those uh, 40 Braille cells. Um, there you see the comparison chart Betsy Ends just put up there for you. It's another great way to go through and understand uh, how all these compare. But the Mantis Q40, price $2,495 for the non-quota price, $1,995 on quota. Uh, you do get that, that QWERTY keyboard and the 40 Braille cells. For the Chameleon 20, if you want the Perkins keyboard, if you're looking for a smaller display, uh, but a lot of the same functionality, all those apps we talked about, uh, William talked about earlier, are in both of these devices. Uh, $1,595 non-quota for the Chameleon, $1,295 on quota. And then we didn't mention this, this one, uh, but we have done plenty of webinars about the Braille Trail Reader. That is still available. You can still purchase that. It's a 14-cell display. If you're looking for the most portable one, obviously that's going to be it. If you're looking for very small size uh, and it has some different apps and things as well that uh, you can feel free to check, check out the page on it or some of our uh, other webinars. And it is $995 on quota or if you purchase it, not on quota. So those are our offerings. Uh, that chart, can be helpful. Uh, feel free to contact customer service with additional questions. Uh, you know, we'd be happy to answer as many of those as we possibly can through all the different channels that are available to you. Did we have some remaining questions in the chat? Yeah, we've got some. Can we get copies of the resource links in chat? And I think 
Betsy Ann's providing that. Yeah, she may yeah. she may toss those in one more time, but they should be there. So yeah. the the other question is: Is it possible to use the Perkins style keyboard on the note taker built into the Mantis? Say, if I want to type Braille music, uh, that requires Perkins entry. So yes, um, the hot key I think is F twelve. So you press F12 and then that puts you in six key mode on the Mantis and then that's SDF and uh, JKL to six key. And that'll only work in local mode. Were there other questions that I'm missing here? Um, oh, yes. Is it possible to use Perkins style keyboard on the note taker built yeah. into the Mantis, for example, using uh, it to type Braille music that requires Perkins entry? Yeah, no, that's that's the one I uh, just answered. And yes, oh, I apologize. So F12. No, you're fine. So the one thing about that, so with the Braille music, um, you need the BRF editor. And that's something where we've got coming. It's not in there right now. Right now, the editing you're going to be doing is print. So even though F12 will let you type using the Perkins style uh, key entry there, uh, what you're going to be creating is actually print. Um, so with that BRF editor, though, that we're going to be developing, you'll be able to type Braille, get Braille, save Braille. Um, a lot of folks that are using the Mantis, they were like, I'm a Braille, uh, you know, I work in Braille. I need to create Braille files. Um, so that's why we're making this BRF editor is for folks that, that want to keep their, their files as Braille rather than create a print file. All right. Well, I think we answered all of the questions. Any final, any final wrap us up for us, William? Any things to be looking forward to, or join uh, us at NFB to learn more? Yeah, we're going to be at NFB. We're talking about the Braille displays at NFB, and we're talking about the dynamic tactile display. Uh, we've been working on an eBRF proposal. Uh, we're going to be talking about that at NFB. Uh, I hope folks will come hear more about that. Um, and we're going to be at the NBA uh in the fall that's more of a transcriber conference and we're going to be at getting in touch with literacy in the fall uh we're going to be in person it's going to be great to to be with folks in person um uh, before the next pandemic and we all go back inside oh, no. <laughs> i let's said it out loud <laughs> let's hope not yeah all right. Well, thank you so much, William. Uh, this was a very much requested webinar, and we hope that uh, folks have gotten a lot out of it. Um, we've got a few questions coming in. Will the BFF editor be an upgrade when it is released? All the updates are going to be free. BRF. Yeah, we have no plans to charge for updates. So when we make the BRF editor, you'll get an update. Just like you know, we talked about updating, and you'll you'll update, and then you'll you'll suddenly have a BRF editor in your uh, file system there.